Awesome. Caitlin, hi. Welcome. Hi, I'm so excited and happy to be here. And I know I shared this with you briefly before we started recording, but I feel like I needed this space today. So yes. thank you. And and I agree. And that's what I think is so beautiful about this. I I don't this podcast doesn't make me a ton of money, believe me. Like I get a couple of free things here and there, which is really nice, but it's just it's like a, it's a passion project, but it's such an, I just really love talking to other people and learning from them. And I love being able to utilize this space. And I definitely think I needed it today too. So we're going to see where we go. <laughs> yeah, I totally understand that. I, um, when I started my podcast, it was like, I had just been talking to people and having all of these amazing conversations for so many years and yes. I wasn't doing anything with them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I kind of need that space to be able to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to be here. Yes, I know. And I was really excited. I love yours too. I loved, uh, I'm going to have to try to get Ian e Trudy on here because I really want to have that conversation too. <laughs> um, and the I, the I will, of course, link to your show in the show notes for today. Oh, hello, Kitty. I'm uh, so sorry. Listen, no? Meg, can I, I'm, this is, I'm explaining this is between you and I, because I know you can edit this out, yeah. but life is just a hot mess right now. So can yeah. you give me one moment to like yes. do something about? Of course. Of course. Oh my gosh. Yes. So I'm so excited to just be in the space and talk. Um, I was going to ask, do I know you through Jackie? Is that how we know each other? Instagram is the answer. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely through Instagram for the past, I guess, couple of months. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. insanity of the world. Um, well, tell me, I really want everyone to get to know a little more about you who has, doesn't already know who you are. Like, tell me about, tell us about Kind Cotton. Where did it come from? You used to be a teacher. Like, kind of give us the backstory. Yeah, for sure. So I was a kindergarten teacher in the state of Florida for eight years. And I would say in my second year of teaching, I found myself always coming home to my partner and being like, hey, for every opportunity that I can find, I'm buying books for my students. Like we go to the book fair and a lot of them weren't able to purchase books. So I would buy books for them because one of the worst things in the world is bringing a child to a book fair yeah. and being like, look at all these amazing books that you were so interested in. And by the way, you can't get one. That so, you can't have. Yeah. Yeah. So I was always buying books for my students. Then I was buying, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's yeah. So you're always buying books for your yeah, kids. Yeah, always buying Look books. That for amazing me. United States teacher salary that we have. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, that could be an entire other conversation. Um, well, I got two master's degrees in New York. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I was making like forty grand a year. So mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. spending thousands of dollars on my classroom, like no exaggeration, because. Mm -hmm you need to, right? In order to do the job that you want to do. Yes. Um, so my husband had always worked in custom apparel and I was always coming home to him saying like, I want to do something more. A lot of my students don't have access to books. And then one day I literally came home with this idea and I was like, hey, this may sound wild, but just hear me out. Um, I want to start a small clothing line and I want it to be similar to a Tom's where every single time someone purchases something, we then donate a book to a child. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I don't think that's crazy at all. Like I am all in and kind cotton was born. Um, and back then I can remember just wanting to sell one item a day, like walking out my package to the mailbox and being like, if I sell one item a day, that will fund the reading program that I had started. And now we're able to host free book fairs every single month, distributing thousands of books to kids every single month. And we have gone from, you know, donating about 30 a month to now having donated over 145,000. So it's really awesome. And I love that I get to say that this is what I do for a living. Yes. Yes. Well, and so that's huge. Full chills. I'm wearing a sweater, so you can't tell. But 
Um, that's so huge. So my mom was and actually still is a teacher. I hope she doesn't mind. She listens. Hi, mama. Uh, she actually had to start substitute teaching be, to be able to pay for some medical bills um, for like currently she's teaching right now. And she retired back in 2020. So but she's been a teacher. And so I've just been right alongside the journey of like, I want to make a theme in my classroom, but all of that comes out of my pocket, or I've got these students who go to the book fair and, and all of those things. And it's, it's not the person who is in teaching often for the money, it's for the love of the children and the sharing of knowledge. And so those two have such an, those are two mutually exclusive things of, I want to be able to provide all of these things and I have no money. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's really lovely to be able to be in this space and maybe not mutually exclusive. I was being bombastic, but it, to be able to have that to go. And I love to hear too, that your partner was like, yep, yeah, full stop. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've been really fortunate. We say this all the time. Like we are partners in life and in business. We work from home. So we are together 24 hours a day. Obviously there are things that come along with that. Um, like right now, as Meg knows, we recently got a puppy, which was all my doing <laughs> in probably one of the most chaotic points of our life. And so there's that. However, <laughs> <laughs> nine times out of 10, like we really balance each other out, right? Like I'm the one who does the podcast and does all of the social media and does the book events. And these are the things that I love and I'm passionate about. And he's passionate about like making sure we have money and yes. running the site and all of the analytical stuff that's behind the scenes, editing our podcast. And it's just this really beautiful marriage in so many different ways. So yeah, I'd love to hear that. And I love the, the books that you are putting out, like the, the little engine that could cool. Great. But like the things that I'm seeing mm -hmm. that I've never heard of, um, that are so representative of so many people of so many people's lived experiences, but told in a way that are meaningful for children or appropriate for children, certainly. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I'm just curious, how, how do you find the books? How do you find them? I, I'm, I'm always so excited when I see something new come up. I'm like, I haven't heard of that one either. Yeah, for sure. So there's a couple of different ways. I mean, having been a kindergarten teacher definitely helped, right? Because for so many years I met, not actually met, but virtually met so many incredible educators through Instagram and the connections and the resources and everything that they have shared has been tremendous. I also do a lot of my own extensive research. You know, the statistics, I'm not going to get this 100% correct, but you can obviously Google them. Um, but the statistics of children's books is it's something like between animals and white main characters mm -hmm. children that's like over 60 percent of children's uh -huh. maybe even 70 percent i would have thought more honestly i mean i haven't it, done it, the google yeah it, it is i think it's more and then yeah. when you look at all other groups the numbers are so much lower so they are not representative of what we are seeing in our country and our lives so we try to go the extra mile to ensure that those books are seen by children right that every child feels seen and loved and valued for who they are mm -hmm. um it's something like 90 to 95 percent of the books that we share are either written by or representative of bipoc children LGBTQ plus disabled or have a very strong social emotional learning component to it because that unfortunately is something else that has been under attack in um, educational spaces. And when I say written by, um, it's really important to ensure that the stories that we are sharing are representative of the authors, right? Because they have that lived experience. Right. So yeah, that's what we try to do. Yeah. That's been really interesting to see as well. The mm, I feel like I'm going to go off on my political soapbox here, but I just think it's interesting how so many things that go wrong, particularly in the United States, are then immediately blamed knee-jerk reaction style on mental health. And yet we are so willing to defund social emotional learning. And it's like, okay, but if you're saying, which it's not accurate, there's another podcast episode on that that I've done that I'm truly proud of to be able to articulate that in a better way. But 
if you believe that is the case, then why would we not, if we're not willing to make other reg regulations against other things, why not bolster the mental health component, bolster social emotional learning? And I just am confused all the time. <laughs> that is, so it's really interesting. I just did a podcast episode about this too. Yeah. And there are other things not that I sympathize with whatsoever, but that I can understand people come out with due to misinformation, right? Yes. Like there are things that I get surrounding the appropriateness of certain books because people have been fed the wrong information. Sure. I do not sympathize whatsoever. We will continue to provide books, particularly that have LGBTQ plus representation in them, because the books that we are providing simply say, Heather can have two mommies, Heather can have two daddies, Heather can have a trans parent. Look at all these beautiful family dynamics yes. that can make up Heather's family, and they should be celebrated, and they should be in books the same way that my husband and I see ourselves represented in children's right. books, right? Right. But there has been like a massive twist to say that that is not what it is about. So I can understand the misinformation there. Mm -hmm. I will never understand what you were just talking about, right? Because every single time there is a mass school shooting, the far right and other people will cry, it's not the guns, it's mental health. Mm -hmm. And in the same breath, take away that mental health funding. Yeah, it's- Yes, it's really, it's very confusing um, mm -hmm. to be in that, To I, I don't know. It just, my brain can't process. It doesn't understand. And I'd love, I'd love to know more. Um, yeah. I, I think the problem is, and this is, I think where you and I really got involved with each other is like the idea that the group that we joined was like, we don't want to sit in a place of privilege and just be like, well, that's not a me problem. That's a you problem. Mm -hmm. and I think the problem is with so many of these things, it's like people aren't accessing a book about what it's like to be a child in Palestine or what it's like to be a little kid with two parents who have the same sexual identity or you're like, and so it's othered and it's them and it's not a problem. And I'm just going to sit in my blessed place of privilege and, and, I think that's the other thing too, is the more that we are sharing these things, the more information we have, the less scary things feel. Like, do you know queer people? They're not scary. Like, I don't want to, I say they, not to lump everyone together, but like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a group, if you know, like, but, oh, but you don't know anybody. Well, then I'm surprised that you have such a strong opinion about it. And so I, I just am really, I don't know. I just, I'm going to keep talking about how amazing all the books are that you're getting out for everybody, because it's just really meaningful and it's meaningful for me we are a part of the dolly parton children's imagination library and one of my kids favorite book is hair love and like i have naturally curly hair but i certainly am not experiencing the um you know the daily struggles of finding a hairstylist who knows how to deal with to, to appropriately tend to people of color hair like that's not going to be a problem for us and yet my children are obsessed with that book and it's like what a great and beautiful thing so then when they see a person who has hair that looks like this child that that's not going to be foreign to them. And that's important too, because then there's, there's no fear there. And there's, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, that's like, I think her name's Zuz, Zuzu, Zuri. I am so sorry. We haven't read it in a little bit, but. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, your no. hair looks like Zuri's in my book. Like, oh yeah, let's talk about it. Let's learn from each other. Yeah. And I think that's super important to also just open up conversations with your children too, especially surrounding topics that a lot of white parents shy away from. And I don't think we should be shying away from them because children are naturally curious, right? Like my daughter also loves that book. And then we've also had conversations about, you know, always ensuring that you're not touching other people's hair. Yes. Too. Now, like yes. that can be, you know, microaggressions. And that's something that black women have to deal with that we will never have to deal with. Right. Um, so it really just opens up all of these amazing conversations. And again, if you don't know how to have these conversations, picture books are always a great start, right? Mm -hmm. It's always a great way, like you alluded to, knowing that yes, people are different, but different is beautiful. And different is not something that we should shy away from. Different is something that we should embrace. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's just, it feels like it's getting more and more difficult these days, or maybe it was always difficult, but I'm more aware of it because I have children and, you know, I'm a social worker. So I fancy myself somewhat open-minded and interested in learning and being shown different perspectives, but it just feels like there's just this energy that goes against a lot of that stuff. And I, I wonder kind of what because you are very vocal on the website and the, the causes that you stand for. How do you how do you help kind of fight some of that? I'm going to use my word, kind of the helplessness that we feel. Like, what are some yeah. things that you've been able to do that help you to feel like we're fighting against the, the negative energy? <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because it's easy for me to say this to other people, right? But then taking your own advice is always so, 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 so so difficult. Um, It's not easy for sure. Like it's not, but I've always, ever since I was a really young child and now having been diagnosed ADHD later in life, it kind of makes sense as to what I'm about to say. Um, I was always very passionate. I was always very vocal, sometimes to the point of like maybe getting in trouble in school. And my parents always viewed it as she's passionate. You know, Mm -hmm. she has something to say that is of importance. They never, of course, within like respectful limits in a teacher-child student relationship. Um, But they kind of embraced my outspokenness. And I'm really grateful for that because I don't think that that was something that was, quote unquote, the norm during, I'm assuming we're of similar ages, uh, during our time of growing up. So fast forward to now, there's been a lot of unlearning that I've had to do. There's been a lot of understanding of the systems that are put in place to kind of keep the status quo and particularly for white women to be nice and not ruffle any feathers. And that's why I try to make a point of talking about the difference between niceness and kindness so often because it's nice to hold the door open, right, for a stranger, but it's kind to fight against these systems so that these doors of opportunity remain open for all marginalized communities. It's it's nice to, I don't know, maybe not say something to Uncle Billy at the dinner table, but it is kind to run over to your family member's house like I did and show my mom that she needs to be following all different voices on social media because Western media may only be showing us one side of things, right? So it's not easy. And I don't think I answered your question about that other than the fact that there's always kind of been this like passion within me that has overcome the anxiety of feeling like I may not be liked, which is hard because I am also by nature a people pleaser and it all like collides at once. So I say this to say that if you feel the same way, it's, it's not easy, but what good are we doing if we're not trying? I love that. What good are we doing if we're not trying, if we're doing something? Um, no, I, I really agree with all of that. I relate to all of it. I literally just before you got on, got I'm trying to find a new therapist and I'm trying to, I talked about this in the last episode. So the listeners probably were like, uh-huh, Meg, we already know, but going to say it again, but talking about like the stressors that I had with my ADHD growing up in elementary school. And I don't think I have it. I don't think I meet criteria for oppositional defiant disorder, but I have some tendencies nevertheless and how difficult elementary school was for me. And my son is starting kindergarten this fall. And as I was enrolling him last week, I was like, what is this tension? It's not like, Oh, my baby kindergarten. Like sure, 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 sure. Some of that, of course, but like, really I'm excited for him and he's going to meet new friends and he's so excited he even knows his mascot already. Like it, it's mm. not that. And I was like, what is this tension? And I was like, well, and I watched actually an episode of Abbott Elementary, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but it's great if you haven't. Highly recommend everybody. And one of the teachers, so I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but it's all related to this, I promise. But talking about like the gifted program and not being in the gifted program made him feel like he would never be able to amount to anything because he was told immediately, you're not special, you're not qualified, you're not talented. And they talked about like, 
the idea of different like physical um, intelligence and nature intelligence. And like, just because you may not be able to take a test doesn't mean that you wouldn't be an amazing marine biologist or insert many things there. And for me, it was actually the opposite because I was in the gifted program. And, it, um, and for me, it was like, if you struggle, you're failing. If something doesn't make sense, like everything should come easy to you because you're smart. And so go ahead and do this. And that's what my teachers kind of encouraged of me. And so it's been just in the last week, even being like, oh my gosh, this is a stressor for me. So that was that piece, but also the talking out. I didn't think something was right. I knew something, a teacher had said something wrong and I couldn't sit still with it. I had to say like, no, that's not right. Like I've corrected someone's math or whatever. And it's like, that piece was really missing for me as well. And I love, I've talked a lot about like clarity is kind and nice is keeping your mouth shut. Nice is, I mean, nice is holding the door too. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, but setting expectations and boundaries with people and having them understand means you're setting them up for success in a relationship with you and saying like, I'm not willing to deal with that language or that conversation in my life or that energy is tough because we are expected to be nice little white girls and keep our mouths shut. But being able to say that this is what I expect in a relationship is the kind thing to do. And I think the more that we can reframe it and understand the difference in those words, the more likely we are to operate in such a way. 100%. And it's really interesting hearing you talk about that because I am one person to the world and on my, you know, small following of Instagram and our website and this, that, and the other, like, I talk a big game to, to strangers, right? Or to people who I've like met online. And in one of my first sessions ever with my therapist, she was like, you have zero qualms about advocating for other people, but what you're missing is advocacy for yourself. Hey, and what? Yeah. Like it's a huge hearing you say that. I'm like, Yes. Like that is the part I need to work on being kind to myself, particularly when it comes to personal relationships and setting those boundaries and, mm -hmm. and being as strong in my stance on, ah, I'm still strong in my stance, but more those like interpersonal relationship things. Right. Well, mm -hmm. I, it's really interesting too, especially those of us with children where we, we want to model things for our kids or we're not able to model them because we genuinely don't believe them for ourselves, but we do believe it for our kids. Like, it's okay for you to be upset. Like, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to sit with distress. And, but like, not me, because I have to have it together all the time because I have to be the mom and always be happy and smiling. And how dare I be upset about anything ever? And it's like, but you literally don't say that to your kids. You literally tell them like, hey, if it's ups if you're upset that you broke your crayon, that's real to you. And I'm not going to tell you to not be upset about it. I will maybe perhaps redirect after mm -hmm. five minutes of crying about the same crayon and talk about other things. But um, but we just don't internalize it for ourselves. We just, everything has to be just so. And it's really hard to do that. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, also when it comes to like, consent going back to the boundary thing like I can't even tell you how many times I've talked to my daughter about you don't have to hug anyone you don't want to hug and you know like you can give them a fist bump you can tell them goodbye you can give them a high five you don't have to do anything if you don't want to and that's still being kind but then it's like oh so and so wants to come over unannounced and yep. I just take it even though like no, I should be putting that boundary in place. Like maybe yeah. just call before you come over, you know? Yeah. 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 I have a real something about Mary going on with my hair right now and I'm just kind of leaving it. I don't care. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's so interesting. It's so wild how willing we are to bend over backward for people. And at the same time, in the same breath, say that to our children, that it's not okay. But I do encourage not my, the way that I articulate to clients is always like, hey, you um, you are my client and my goal in having this conversation with you is, of course, for you to be able to make these choices and changes for you based on what your goals are. I was like, but it would be obtuse of me to think that you operate in a vacuum. And by you doing these things, you are displaying those things to your children. And so if not for yourself, if it feels icky to be 
strongly boundaried or to discuss clarity as kind because it feels gross to you or not authentic to you to be able to do it, to show what your, to your children, what it looks like. And then hopefully on the back end, it starts to feel more natural to you because our kids are absolutely watching and they're learning and they're seeing, yeah. it. they're seeing when we walk up to a black woman, put our hands in their hair, We're, you know, like they're seeing exactly. that we think that we have the right and privilege to be able to do that. And so, or not, of course. And so that I think is a way that I help some of my clients kind of reframe things like, if not for you, then for your children. And also you'll benefit from it yourself. 100%. You can't just talk the talk. You have to walk the walk, right? Because children learn the most through modeling. So it is really important. And then in turn, hopefully it helps you as well. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So that's really great. So um, what are some of the, found, like you, I saw your impact book and uh, wanted you to kind of tell everyone, how did things happen? So you you sell the articles of clothing, you get the books or you get you know, the, the funding for that. What kind of happens? What is that process like? Yeah, I love that. So we actually have a book tracker on our website that keeps track of how many books we've donated. And the way that that works on the back end is at the end of every single month, we kind of deduct that number from how many we've actually donated thus far. And then I know at the end of the month, how many more books I have to purchase. And the way in which we get those books into the hands of kids more often than not is through free book fairs. So I was talking a little bit about how the Scholastic Book Fair would stress me out as a teacher. It stresses many children at many yeah, many children out as well. Children, teachers, parents, you know that it's coming. Everyone. You don't have the funds for it, but you know your kids are going to be walked down there with absolutely every single other kid, the ones who have the money to buy all the stuff they want. And then your kid sits there sad amongst yeah. other emotions. Yeah. Exactly. So what we do now is we work with schools. We'll typically come in the week or maybe two after the Scholastic Book Fair So at least teachers can say, hey, I'm really sorry. Like if you can't get a book today, we are having a free book fair next week. Or we work with schools who've done away with scholastic book fairs because they recognize the inequities that are put in place when it comes to having something like a scholastic book fair. And they want to do something that is more inclusive. So I will go to a school. I'll arrive like an hour early. I'll bring thousands of books with me. It's just me in my car with tons and tons of books from floor to ceiling. I will wheel them all in, set it up in the media center, and teachers come in throughout the day with their students in like 15-minute increments. They'll walk around. They find a book that they absolutely love. Every single child gets one book, regardless of if your family has the money to get you 25 books or your family may not have the money to get you a book. And every child gets one book that they are interested in. So there's also like a big sense of value to the children in this too, because they're choosing the book that is most important to them. Mm -hmm. And across the board, it's one book. And then every single teacher gets to take a book Mm -hmm. as well. And if they have any absent students, they grab books for them too, so that everyone in the school Mm -hmm. leaves with a book that day. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's been really amazing. Like the feedback has been incredible. The feedback on the books that we bring just about a month ago, I always ask before I go to a school, like, what are the demographics? How many Spanish speaking students are there? Conversations that I don't think is typically had with other types of book fairs too. And then that's how I do my purchasing. So I went to a book fair in Ohio and these two little girls came up to me and one was like, you ask. No, you ask. No, you ask. And I was like, it's okay. You can ask me anything that you want to ask me. And the one girl said, why do you have so many books of women wearing hijabs? And I said, you know, representation is really important. And I explained to them on a fifth grade level what representation was. And they said, well, we just really wanted to thank you because we are Muslim and our family members wear them. And we have never really had books, particularly at school, in which our family was seen. Mm. And I was like, that's why we do what we do. That right there. Particularly now, right? Like, let's spread some joy and pride 
mm-hmm. around all people. Mm-hmm. Yes. And gosh, what a lovely thing. And I do, I sit in such a place of privilege. I always reflected on my school as being very um, diverse because our counterpart schools in the county, literally like people would say like, oh yeah, there's you know one Asian person and two black people there. Like it, it was as though that was a funny thing to be able to recall. And, and so I was like, oh no, I totally grew up in a ton of diversity or whatever. But then I think about like the fact that, I don't know, I wasn't gonna go here, but the American girls just popped into my mind and they were like, oh, here's a black character. One, here's one. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh. Just checking well, the box. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, I'm so grateful that there are so many opportunities. I mean, the books that are sitting behind you, just so many books that come and come already translated into Spanish because God bless, I'm trying to teach my kids Spanish, but I took German. So my Spanish is asking (laughs) A-L-E-X-A, how do you say this in Spanish? Mm -hmm. And and the, uh, we could also go on a whole other, we should maybe just do an episode about education in this country and talk about why kindergarten Spanish is not compulsory because yeah, the language and why are we not learning it? I don't know. Yep. Every country in Europe learns English mm-hmm. as a matter of course, and then they do a foreign language and, you know, junior high or gymnasium or whatever they have it. But anyway, um, but yeah, it's just really, it's really meaningful. And that's so lovely that those two came up and were like, hey, yeah tell us about that. (laughs) Yeah. It was the first time that people or the children really connected the dots, right? Like I've had children come in before. There was one little girl who came in and she was so excited that there was a little girl who looked like her, who was also in a wheelchair, but no one has ever been like, thank you because of X, Y, Z. And like, I haven't had this. It was really like, profound for them to express that but that goes back to like kids get it right kids get it yeah and it makes children feel good to see themselves like I didn't have to worry about that growing up no not at all Barbies looked like me Mm -hmm. what yeah everything everything movies television shows Disney, Disney princesses, you know, everything. I remember it was such a big deal. And I think, is it called the princess and the frog? It might be called something different. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That one came out and it was like a black princess. Yeah. Tiana. Mm -hmm. And that was, gosh, I don't, I'm not going to, I don't know Disney history, but like that was in the two thousands of some. Yeah. I would think so. It was late. Let's Mm -hmm. say it was late. So, um, but yeah. And you know, I'm so grateful Moana exists and there's another one coming out and it's my daughter's favorite. And, you know, just, it's just really nice to be able to see that. And we also just have so, we have so far to go. Mm -hmm. And so it's really great that we have, you know, agencies and people like you who are helping to continue to let that grow and go because for everything that's going on like that, there are also the people who are saying like, no, Johnny can't have two mommies in this school. We're going to ban that book and mm-hmm. they're out the library. And Oh, yeah. That is all, all the things that you hear are absolutely true. Having been, I don't know if I mentioned this when, when I said I was a teacher for eight years, but I was a teacher in the state of Florida. Um, so all of those things you hear very much are, are true. Yeah, I was actually... The district that I was in is where the founder of Moms for Liberty is Uh actually on our school board. So Uh I was like really in the thick of all the beginning book burn, like book burning. Sorry. It may as well be book banning um, and everything. Yeah. But that's interesting because I know people in Florida who are quick to, this is the problem with disinformation and I'm mm-hmm. not saying I have all the right information either. So please don't be like, and come to me because I have it all correct. But the idea is that the people who are defending it, like, oh, that's not what he meant. That's not what they're doing. That's not, that's not true. And it's like, okay, but it is like, you can read mm-hmm. in the letter of some of the laws and legislature and whatever else it might look like that it really is happening in that way. And I do, I just ask the question, is that the thing, like, do we really want a homogenized world? Like, I Mm. I don't understand why people get so concerned about, about a lot of things. Like if it's not applicable to you, then maybe don't have an opinion or have an open mind and wait until it 
to somebody who lives that experience can educate you or again, it's not their job to educate you. Yeah. Yeah. No. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. I want to be very clear. Like it's not somebody else's job to educate you, but making sure that you're being intentional about where you get your news and understanding like, and if it seems too good or too bad to be true, perhaps maybe it is and and doing some more Googling and asking around or trying to find um, something that can help it make more sense or to, to be understood before making that knee jerk reaction and, and voting as such, or, um, you know, putting your money toward causes that support those things that take away individual freedoms and diversity and all of that. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I, I just, uh, we won't speak about a specific space, but I remember people were so upset that a restaurant had a DEI initiative. And I was like, wait, so you're opposed to diversity, equity, and inclusivity. You're just opposed to that on the out set. And I've never had somebody, I don't actually know anybody who believes that, but I did see it in social media. And I was just, I'm so curious, like, how do we get to a space where we're just like, nope, don't want it. Yeah, I know. I I mean, I think that goes to, I'm happy you brought that up because again, when you think about Florida specifically, there are, and I was just talking to a friend about this and made a video about it. There are a lot of people who will get behind the don't say gay bill, right? Like myself included, our company has done a lot in efforts to combat that in efforts to provide books in which queer youth feel seen or queer families feel seen. Um, And then there isn't as much intensity when it comes to things like the Stop Woke Act, for instance, or which is essentially taking away DEI initiatives in schools, the um, halting of accurate history because white children may be, will feel uncomfortable. And it all comes back to white supremacy, right? Like it all, like it is the underlying evil of our country and it's something that I feel like we all need to really take a step back and and get uncomfortable and fight towards dismantling these systems because in the end, like, it is going to affect all of us, right? And I think that's a hard thing. We were talking about this before and you were like, oh, kind of out of sight, out of mind, right? Like, that's not affecting me at this moment. And there's two things I say to that. One is something I say all the time is it doesn't have to happen to you for it to matter to you, right? Well, like, yeah. we can have empathy. We we don't yeah. have to, and my listeners will have heard this a million times, but we didn't have to have a family member die of COVID to wear a mask right? Or we don't have to have a Black child to understand that there are horrible things when it comes to the police department, right? Like we we don't have to have an LGBTQ child to fight for LGBTQ rights. But I will also say that there are certain pieces to this that will harm all of us, you know? Like climate is 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 right coming for all of us like and and it is that like capitalistic white supremacist mindset um that just keeps the greed flowing and the the collective activism down here right um there's an amazing and i know that you know about this meg but there's an organization um that i've been following, been a part of for quite some time now since I started called Here for the Kids. And it's really this like beautiful abolitionist movement of taking care of each other and being in community and fighting for things that will actually help our planet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And our children. Well, so I have I have two two places that I want to go. And if I could have you for the rest of the day, I think we could just unpack so much of this. The first thing I wanted to talk about was the term white supremacy and why people are so easily Mm -hmm. like, it's not me because I'm not in the KKK and it's like, white, but that doesn't mean that you don't benefit from white supremacy and that you don't unknowingly or subconsciously participate in it and unknowingly benefit from it. And that's, Mm -hmm. again, you were talking about getting uncomfortable and that's the problem. And this is what I was talking about earlier, right? Of like, 
how do we just sit with being uncomfortable instead of judging ourselves and being like, you shouldn't be upset about this thing. So get over it. It's like, no, I'm allowed to be upset about it. I am upset about it. So I'm not going to judge myself for it. And I'm going to move forward. We benefit from white supremacy. You can call it whatever it is that you want that maybe makes you feel more comfortable if that is a different way. And yes, you are not actively sending money to an organization that openly puts forward and tries to push through white supremacy, but being able to understand the privilege and that we don't all start in the same space, especially in the United States, but in a number of places and mm -hmm. being able to, to sit with that discomfort. And again, it's about the empathy. And I think we have tuned ourselves out to so much empathy of, well, that's not a problem for me. So it shouldn't be a problem for you. You have some sort mm -hmm. of faultiness. There's some sort of internal what's the word I'm looking for? Like you're just an inherent issue mm -hmm. with you because that's not a problem for me, but it's like, it again, and I think the problem is, is that you and I, yes, big nod head. head. I made so many masks because I love to sew and donated them. I was the queen of masks. I, it wasn't a problem for me because, and we did, we just moved to Kansas. We didn't know anybody. We weren't going anywhere, but like, absolutely. But you're, what you said doesn't apply to everybody. Some people couldn't care less about masks and on the opposite end of that mm. fought so hard against it mm -hmm. and didn't care that so many people had lost loved ones because we just don't care to empathize. And instead of being like, wow, this might help somebody else, it's annoying to me, so I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really think you and I both our energy is to encourage people to like, take a breath, take a step back, look at some of this, acknowledge where you might fit into it you are not a card carrying member of a white supremacy club. And yet just think, just consider how that might be for you, how yeah. that might impact you and how you as a white person might be able to then make some, try, try to make some changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's, it's systems, right? Like it's, it's systems. It's, it's exactly. systems. Like it's not some personal attack saying you were good or bad but the reality is is that we do benefit from the system that has so yes. strategically been put in place yes. and another thing um that I think is really important to talk about too I mean with anything but COVID is just at the top of my mind is that I even know people who had lost something had lost someone but we allow our egos to get into the way. So I always say to me that kindness is rooted in justice, grounded in action, and open to change, right? Open when to we change. find that open to change, say it again, open to change. Yes. yes. If I it's know that so I do this. Show. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's okay to be wrong, right? Like I mess things up all of the time. I'm sure if I listen back to this podcast, there's something that I said that may have not have been the right thing and taking ownership of that and mm -hmm. learning and growing and doing the things that you need to do to change your mind is okay. But our egos get in the way. So it's like, Oh, if I like knew right from the start that this whole COVID thing was made up and it was just some political stunt to further divide us all and no one's actually dying. And then, God forbid, my dad passed away from it. It's okay to say you were wrong. Mm. It's okay to change. Mm. But we get so wrapped up in our own egos that we can't get out of our own way. One of the most beautiful examples of this I just saw, I am obsessed with drag culture, um, specifically RuPaul's Drag Race, I will admit, but I also am going to my local Hamburger Mary's tomorrow for Valentine's Day, um, support your mm. local queens and drag performers and artists. But one of my favorite is Mo Hart, and they were talking about, I didn't actually see the original post, I saw the post that they made after. And they had said something about like, they had thought that all people with autism were incapable of speech and had struggles with a, a, it was a different level of functioning than to ascribe to every person on the autism spectrum which is why it's called a spectrum and people wrote notes to mo and were like hey you got that wrong and mo wrote did the most beautiful like thank you for educating me i said this thing i thought i knew i was talking about i did not I did some Googling. You all you shared your emotional and intellectual labor with me. So I didn't have to do all of the legwork and thank you for that. 
And now here's what I know about autism. And I continue, will continue to try to grow and learn more about that and try to keep an open mind. But, and I literally wrote back, I was like, and, and Mo liked my comment, which made me feel like, <laughs> I'm so cool. <laughs> but to say like, this is exactly what we need. We need people to understand that we are not, we are expected to know everything all the time, but who is that voice? Who is they? Who expects that of us? I don't know. So let's shove them off, whoever the they is, and understand that we're going to operate with the best intentions, with kindness and empathy, with clarity, with the information we have, and then be open to new information to make better choices based on new and evolving information. And I, when when Mel Hart did that, I was like, this is the best thing ever. And I shared it in my stories. I'm like, let's all take that energy. Like, you don't have to know everything. You will speak. We're speaking right now. And again, I agree with you. I probably said something that was off base in this today mm -hmm. and in other ones. And then being able to go from there. So softening our hearts in a way of it's okay to change and change your opinion and change your understanding based off new information. Yeah. Something I'm still telling myself all the time. Yes. Yeah. And it's really tough. And then the other thing, gosh, I really honestly wish I could keep you for like three more hours. Well, I, I'm so excited to come onto your show as well. So I know, I'm excited more, too. But, but to talk about that selfish piece for me, I was talking earlier about my emotional concerns from my elementary school experience and that going to my son, but also my son's going to kindergarten and I'm terrified of him being part of a mass shooting. And that's something that I, my senators and representatives all know my name by now. They've gotten a lot of information, my thoughts on what's going on in West Asia and what's going on with national federal licensure for social workers and a number of things. And I don't think they give two hoots, but I'm going to keep emailing them, but especially about that too. And you were talking about here for the kids and, and trying mm -hmm. to find ways to make meaningful, like children's lives are more important than your access to guns mm -hmm. and people are not able to rationalize that emotional I don't know what the thing is that they need to get to the thing that helps them to understand that like go hunting whatever whatever and is there a way that we can have some better regulation so that tiny babies aren't getting shot in kindergarten classes mm -hmm. and I think that's why here for the kids has been so amazing for me personally because in many ways, you're right. A lot of people are not ready to have those conversations, particularly when you talk about like banning guns, right? And implementing a buyback program, which is what they are all about. And I think it's important now more than ever to be in community with one another and to also like have these conversations, have these conversations surrounding abolishment, right? And surrounding the the taking away of guns because it is more important for our children to be safe right and it's about normalizing somewhat and that's kind of what like care for the kids is doing now is they realized a lot of people were not yet ready to you know sign off on an executive order to ban guns and buy them back but what a lot of people are ready for is to start having conversations surrounding how can we make a difference mm -hmm. and how can we continue showing up for each other, for your kid, for my kid, for mm -hmm. our future so that it becomes more normalized to have these conversations um, as opposed to just giving up? Because that is what the system wants us to do, yes. right? When it comes to anything, they're going to tire you out. They're going to make you feel as though your voice does not matter. I saw this thing on Instagram a couple of weeks ago, and it sits with me every day when I'm feeling this way. It said, but what can I really do? Said 7 billion people, right? Oh my gosh. I right? love that. Mm -hmm. So every day when I'm like calling my reps and thinking, yes. oh my goodness, they're tired of hearing from me and this, that, and the other, I just keep reminding myself that. And if, if it does nothing else, other than makes me feel as though when I lay my head down at night, I've done something to hopefully create a little ripple of change, then so be it. Yeah. I, that, that's the big 
overarching theme of our discussion today is right like go and you're not saying this i'm saying this go buy some shirts at kind cotton like go do that because that then helps you to have the tools to put books into kids hands so that they can see that other people like white kids need to see books of people with hijabs white kids need to see books of people with different types of hair and different skin colors mm -hmm. and straight kids family straight kids of straight families need to see Tommy can have two mommies or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever the amalgam is there. Like it's important for everybody to see that. And so being by putting your money where your mouth is, by putting your money where your heart is, perhaps, and that I think is a better space, um, that it can be done. The five is it called five calls app? I have it. Um yeah. mm -hmm. so know. easy. It's so easy. Go check so that easy. out. Um, I like to use email because I like to just put a little email together and just send it out. Yeah, true. Days. Yep. Um, whatever makes you whatever floats your boat um and it's hard not to excuse me it's hard not to feel helpless I do myself sometimes and also we're in these communities intentionally to try to to try to make change and try to keep each other going but I love yeah. that idea what can one person do said seven billion people mm -hmm. you're not alone like that's the thing you're not the only one calling your reps you're not the only one crying at night. You're not the only one doing whatever it is that you're doing when it comes to like an advocacy space. And I think that's why the community piece is so important. So it is, it really does keep me going. Our group that we're in on Instagram is so helpful for me because sometimes I do feel like I just can't. And sometimes I can't. And sometimes I sit in a place of privilege and give myself a little bit of a break, but then I hop right back in and it keeps the fuel of the fire going. So I do encourage everybody use the social media for good. Start following the people who are saying the things that you believe that you stand behind, send a DM, comment on posts, see where you can get involved, see if you can get a group of people together and have your own little text thread or WhatsApp or Instagram messenger, because you're not alone in thinking that things are backward or messed up. And together we can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Too. Yes. No. All right. Well, um, I could keep you forever, but I got to let you go. So tell everybody where they can find you. We'll put all the links in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. So our website is kindcotton.com. And then I'm most active on Instagram and TikTok. And both of those are kind cotton. So okay. really easy peasy. Yes. And then also, of course, the kindness is podcast. Go over there, give a listen. Got a lot of great information being shared there. And you just get to hear from Caitlin more, which is lovely. Thank you. That's my absolute pleasure. Well, thank you, Caitlin, so much. I, like I said, I could have talked for hours um, and I really appreciate you sharing your intellectual and emotional labor with us. And dear listener, remember, be curious, not judgmental, and we'll see you next time.